In 2008, a group of Filipino reform advocates banded together to provide a convergence point for the diverse reform initiatives in the country. What makes this group different from other reform-oriented movements is its composition. All experts in their own fields who have come together and who now apply a more scientific discipline to the advocacy for reform. And thus was born the Movement for Good Governance. Good evening, I'm Tony Abad and this is Political Capital. Our guest tonight, Movement for Good Governance Chair and former Economic Planning Secretary, Solita Winnie Monsod, with the MGG founder and former Finance Undersecretary, Dr. Milwida Nene Guevara. Who are the main movers of this MGG? There Nene? were several of us who okay. founded MGG, including Bilus, uh, mm. Quintin Pastranas, Wanna change so many uh, people from diverse groups. I recall it was almost a spontaneous uh, occurrence. Something sparked it. Something motivated that that event <laughs> back in 2000. It was bad governance okay. and really the dream for a better governance. In fact, it was the late Francis Varela who drafted our mission statement. It's really Filipinos banding together to be able to promote work and become examples of good mm. governance. So remember the alleged cheating? Okay. So uh, I, I, I guess people reach the ultimate point of dissatisfaction and anger. And so we wanted to translate the social anger into something positive and really putting together a voice to uh, the discontentment and the clamor for a government that we truly deserve. What has, has, has become of MGG between 2008 and now, you know, through a whole ad administration, there must have been a movement of the movement. Well, Tell I, you what happens, because you're experts in your own fields, yeah. right? And you're working for good governance. And naturally, you are, the, the administration is attracted to you. Yes. So they ask people to join them. So we're, you know, we're together and then People, benchmark the Aquino administration. People get remember. asked to join the administration, right. and we remain, we, the ones who remain, scorecard, I mean, benchmark yes. the administration. So we have not only been talking, we're not only talking about scorecards for the next election, but we have been benchmarking the administration for the past five years. That's one important role, it seems, is that, you know, so, sort of a uh, not, not exactly fiscalizer, but uh, an objective analyzer. Yes. yes. Somebody yeah. who assesses the performance, not based on perception, but based on statistics, data, and what is really happening. Well, tell us now more about this scorecard, how you keep score, and what, what are the criteria, what's the science behind you know, analyzing an administration? Well, one, is he effective, meaning to say, is he competent? Two, does he empower? Does he consult his people? And three, is he corrupt? <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you know, ethics, ethics, you know, is he corrupt? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's not really the MGG that does the scoring. I mean, no. No. It's, it's not your score, basically. No, it's the score not. of those who participate in the, in the scorecard. We are trying, essentially, this is an attempt to get the voters to judge or to choose their leaders on a more objective basis. Because, you know, when you, when you ask people who are you going to vote for, or guapo, or, or you know, kaibigan ko, or kaklasiko. And we're trying to get away from that. How do you reach to, you know, everybody, basically? Indeed, indeed. The scorecard is written in Filipino in yes. different dialects. And Mamwini, in fact, translated the scores into Number one is mahina, very weak. Number two is kulang. Okay. And third is pasang awa. It means he just barely reaches the benchmark. So it's really for the average Filipino. Um, and you've done some work already on this current election. Yes. Yeah, we feel this is a really turning point in our country's uh, movement towards change. We're going to have a website. We have a website. It will be on, on January 30. And the people can see, at least for the presidentials, you know, all the information 
about them. They will have the scorecard and they will be able to judge these candidates based on their own feelings. When we come back, a preview of the scorecards for five major presidential candidates. Please stay with us. You're back on Political Capital, and joining our discussion is Dr. Ronald Mendoza, Director of the Asian Institute of Management Policy Center. Welcome, Ron. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So, uh, let's take a look at those scorecards, uh, and we're now going to use uh, our uh, candidates as a sample of how these scorecards work. Um, now, could you please provide uh, an example of how this, the criteria, guide questions, and, and the research that has been done on the different candidates would work no? it, it, when you, you sort of uh, let the scorecard system uh, operate. No? And then let's take this alphabetically. So let's start with uh, Vice President Binay. Well, he has a very deep and broad background on local governance, no? okay. having occupied different positions. Plus, his uh, background on empowerment is he has been delivering goodies to the citizens of Makati. But of okay. course, with respect to ethical character, there are many allegations of graft and corruption. Plus, peop, uh, he has established many sister cities. And there has been question on why the taxes of paid by people from Makati should be used uh, to establish sister cities and giving aid to many other local governments. Okay, that affected the third mm. criteria. Sa effectiveness, Vice President, Advisor on o of OFW Concerns, Chairman of Housing. So his, his accomplishments are there. Okay. And then in empowerment, free social services in the residents of Makati, ethical character, corruption allegations, BSP Alpha Land Corporations, overpriced Makati City Hall, and science house, 500 ghost employees, Education, yeah, UP, BA, Political Science, Law 1967, MPA, UST, Masters in National Security. So it's a really objective and, and fair. What about uh, Duterte? Seven terms or 22 years served as vice mayor and congressman. Davao was voted as the fourth most peaceful city in the world. Served as special counsel of the city prosecutor's office, bachelor of law, San Beda College. And then, sa empowerment niya, does he empower his people? He gave formal representation to the Muslims and Lumad communities by asking deputy vice mayors to represent their interests. Yeah, lang ito. Okay. okay. Now, yeah. into ethical character. Summary execution of criminals remains the most effective way to crush kidnapping and illegal drugs. Mayor Duterte in the Crime Summit in 2005. This is a this quote. Is quotation. Yes, this okay. is from him, himself. So, you know. Has been criticized <laughs> by the UN General Assembly of Human Rights and Amnesty International for doing nothing and supporting extrajudicial killings of alleged criminal by Davao death squads. Ron, what do you think of this uh, methodology and so far the results we're, we're seeing? Yeah, I, I think actually it's it's a very interesting innovation, and uh, if only we were able to roll it out uh, nationwide with some strong regularity. Uh, we would have more informed voters. Uh, okay. If you think about it, um, much of this work should have been done by our political parties, should have been done through primaries, should have been done through a process that actually makes uh, all the candidates uh, properly vetted. But since we don't have that, we need groups like MGG to step up and create these types of innovations. But of course, the challenge is, how do we penetrate the bigger mass of our population and get them all engaged? One of our advocacies at the Policy Center is to reach out to young people. Mm. And the young people are uh, basically collected in academic institutions. Mm -hmm. And if they can start to discuss this, maybe even infect their parents, you know, discuss it with them at home, uh, maybe that's a force multiplier as well. Okay. How about Grace Paul? Senator, of course, worked at FPJ Productions and Film Archives Incorporated. Worked in the United States as a teacher, a product liaison officer, and a product manager. Chairs, chairperson of the Movie and Television 
Review and Classification Board championed the implementation of age-appropriate TV and movie classification system. That's her effectiveness. effectiveness. Yeah. She headed the committee which investigated the Mamasapano tragedy with five Senate hearings and five executive sessions. What is our education? Development Studies, University of the Philippines, Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, Boston College, Massachusetts. In the empowerment, there is no information Kasi on what she has I. done mm. to no to really empower the people or consult, etc. Even legislation that uh -oh. she's helped. Yung empowering kasi, it's, it's really, really a participatory system of leadership and listening, uh, giving opportunities mm -hmm. for people to reach their potential, capacity building. Wala siya nun pa eh. In other words, she hasn't done anything yet to show us that she has, you know, she's trying to empower the Filipino, because that's the whole, the whole, that's that's the real objective of development, you know, to empower the Filipino, meaning to say the D and E group, etc. And then, sa ethical character, well, we all know this, faces issues on citizenship. Mm -hmm. She became a natural rice American citizen. She renounced her Philippine citizenship. Okay. Ron, how do you react to yeah. the findings on, on, on Paul? Just a quick uh, comment on the empowerment. Uh, if I understand correctly, she was a firm supporter of FOI. And certainly, FOI is a way to empower a lot of people accessing data, holding government accountable. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if there's something to be said about that, at least. Because uh, it's not really the laws that as an attorney sponsor, it's really her leadership style. Mm -hmm. oh, so she may be an advocate of the FOI, but has but she sure. really gone out of her way to enable, to build capacities yeah. of people? But in the past years, really her role is as senator. So mm. I guess as senator, you're a lawmaker. But in other words, if you're, you're scoring... Yeah, well, it's cool. It, it, it's what she does as senator. Uh, that's it. I guess. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that, that, that helps empower otherwise. No, no? But, but he has a point. You know, you have a point and she has a point. Her, her point is, it's got to be what the candidate has done in order to get, you know, to help the Filipino people participate. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think she has done that yet. Well, let's take a look at uh, Secretary Mar Rojas. Wow. So in, in sum, how does, how does his effectiveness uh, look like? Because as a legislator and as a DTI secretary, he fathered the BPO industry. He nurtured its growth. But there had been some commentary also that the BPO industry just grew. It wasn't his... He, he established uh, the framework. The ground rules. Oh, oh. Okay. What about as DOTC secretary? Ay, wala eh. Wala. Oh, oh. Nothing... Uh, Ay, kli lang siya dun eh, di ba? Parang marami siyang controversy dun, pero hindi... But they're not cited. Oh, oh. They're not discussed. How about empowerment? He expanded the seal of Jesse Robredo from the seal of good housekeeping into the seal of good governance. Ron, what do you think of these? Well, uh, I think there's finance? something to be said about what you mentioned earlier. Your function in government certainly opens the door for you to shine in certain areas of empowerment, of showing your leadership. And of course, if you, if you don't use that opportunity or you, you miss the boat, let's say, in terms of having done something really uh, spectacular as you know that that particular leader then then maybe we should put something there also like in, in terms of missed opportunities because I think uh, if you are uh, the ILG secretary mm -hmm. and, and of course it's a really tough job uh, and if you are a senator it does open certain doors and doesn't necessarily funnel you through others so just on the empowerment uh, variable um, the ILG secretary should be traveling and meeting all the LGU officials uh, trying to implement that uh, set of reforms that Secretary Robredo himself uh, initiated. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a senator, maybe there's a different sort of uh, process for you mm -hmm. and a different way of showing the leadership mm -hmm. pattern you're looking for. Okay. How about uh, Senator Santiago? She served many posts in government, judge of the regional trial court, secretary of agrarian and reform, Commissioner of Immigration, yes, Senator for three terms. She was a Magsaysay awardee. And she was a TOYM. Mm, okay. Then outstanding, you know, she has a brilliant record. She filed 1,007 okay. bills and records. <laughs> which, which we cannot <laughs> read. Uh. But, no, <laughs> you know, empowerment. Known for her temper 
and insulting people <laughs> during in, senator. Is that an empowerment? <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. because oh, oh. you know when you when you insult people, you you know you kind of oppress oh, them. It's disempowerment. Right? Oh, oh. It's oh dis okay. You know, it's not during the, senate, the Supreme Court expressed deep concern about the language of the senator which undoubtedly crossed the limits of decency and good professional conduct. Based on the Supreme Court. Uh, okay, so this is a Supreme Court decision. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Ethics was ordered suspended by Sandigan Bayan and upheld by the Supreme Court for 90 days from the Senate for violation of anti-graft, I didn't even know this, huh? And corrupt practices. And corrupt practices because th th this had to do with the approval of applications when she was commissioner. I mean, okay. but but these are facts. They're on the record, so you have to put it in there. Uh, manage to power to be in to power. be in power despite changes changes in presidency. I mean, she was in. You know, that's yes. true. She was she was good friends with Arab. She was mm. good friends with uh, Gloria. And was she good friends with with Noy Noy? Noy? Oh. Okay. Is that a plus or a minus? Well, how can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, I'm just takes talent, you know. That's, maybe she's talented, you know, you got, know. you know, but maybe, <laughs> but maybe the devotee would say, "Hey, that's not a minus. Okay. That's a you plus." Them. So, okay. Because but if she they're had, the ones so that span these but different the, the important thing is, you tell them what it is. I, I have a lot of interest on the empowerment variable. Actually, on, on that front, uh, I do tend to agree that um, if that's your style of sort of leadership, uh, you don't necessarily empower. The people who want to provide facts, who, who want to testify in Senate and all of this. But on the other hand, I think we must acknowledge that many people do sort of relate to her very well because of this latent um, sort of, I don't well, know, lack of voice uh, that suddenly she's sort of taking on these controversial issues, speaking up about them, wants mm -hmm. to say uh, a lot of things that maybe a whole bunch of us are not able to say. So in a, in a sense, different. it's empowering. It, yes. So but that's different because when you're berated in front of a Senate committee hearing, you're, that's very oppressive. Yes, the you well, lose your which is why I agreed. After the break, uh, benchmarking the Aquino administration versus previous ones. Welcome back. You're still with Political Capital. Um, Nene, you have another scorecard which you use for elected officials, one that compares campaign promises and platforms and, and actual yeah, implementation and performance. That's benchmarking the performance okay. of the Aquino administration. So you have a score for uh, the Aquino administration? Every okay. year. Okay. Uh, it comes before the State of the Nation address. So what have we found from his first... Uh, it was 4.9 during the, uh, his first sauna. Okay. So last year, it was 6-something. Six 6.1. Now, now it's down to 5.8. The score is from 1 to 10. Okay. With 10, he really uh, complied with his promises and all the targets were accomplished. Okay. Uh, a score of 5 or a score of 6. Right. He has achieved more than half of his targets. But one thing we have to give him credit for is that there was a really large uh, reform portfolio that, that needed to be done. And so 50, 60 percent of this uh, getting done is still something to be uh, celebrated, yes. I think. Do you have any findings on the previous administration, um, the Arroyo administration, uh, something that you can compare the Aquino administration with? The agriculture benchmarking just compared the growth and the development during the Gloria administration and the Aquino administration. Okay. And the paper suggested that growth was even faster during the Gloria administration. The Arroyo. But you did some scorecards also on 2010 presidential balls and 2013 senatorial balls. How can we use this scorecard system to really promote good policy, uh, empowering policy, ethical policy? Is it, is it really through this exercise? No. That has to be through another because you're asking them what they are going to do. Yes. We did that in 2010 because we knew what their platforms were. Do you know what the platforms are of the present candidates? Nothing yet. Okay. What, what do they stand for? Yes, what do they Nothing stand yet. for? Nothing yet. So how can you judge them? 
on that basis. Once we have their platforms, once we have their programs, but they always say, you know, oh no, ito mga platforma ito, nothing, you know, what you yeah. want is action. O hindi ba sabi ni Duterte yun? You know, what's these platforms for? Yeah, we have this impression that platforms aren't taken seriously. Well, we want country. to take those platforms seriously. Sana, they should take a stand. The, yeah. the thing is, their platforms are the same. Eh? And they are uh, translated or articulated in very general motherhood statements. Why is it On that platforms, platforms aren't yes. taken seriously in this country? Yeah, well, I go back again to that uh, root uh, sin, which is we don't have strong political parties. So it, it just struck me that they can promise the world to us. But they, their capability to deliver this will depend on everybody else that gets elected. And whether all the LGU officials, all the, the rest of government sort of pull together uh, under their leadership. Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, we seem to be putting a lot of emphasis on that one person in yes. Malacanang and then forgetting the rest of the infrastructure uh, which is comprised of Guess what? Well, uh, a lot you know, of people have been be there nice, for a long time. If it would be nice to ask in the, during the debates, there are the, you know, the Comelec is mm -hmm. is uh, scheduling debates. It would be nice to have the debates based on their platforms. Yes. But we also ask very specific questions exactly. about their stand yeah. on. You know, yeah. what's your advice to the the electorate and maybe the next generation on, you know, really how we how we come up with our decision on, on candidate. I, I think each citizen needs to seriously ask himself or herself, what are the root causes of where we are today? And, and not just be satisfied with things on the surface. Uh, and, and obviously the politicians like to talk motherhood statements and all of this. But I think there's a, a greater consciousness now, especially among our youth, of the things that ail us and, and where it uh, stems from. So if we, if we begin to look at this from, from that perspective and, and dig deeper, uh, you'll recognize that what they are promising and what needs to be done are almost always totally different things. Yeah. And so we must push them to actually do the deep structural reforms. And, and that's what needs to take place. I wish we had more time to enlighten the public. And I think we will probably have another opportunity to discuss. Uh, maybe post we'll ask you to score the candidates. <laughs> So we have, we have a lot of work ahead of us. The Movement for Good Governance was founded on a mission to institute positive change by applying a scientific method and discipline to the advocacy for reform. In past electoral exercises, the MGG has confirmed through their scorecard mechanism that voters simply need properly organized data. Filipino voters are thinking voters, regardless of their class, profession, religion, and regional background. And what they need are the facts to come up with informed decisions and the best results for the nation. This is Tony Abad for Political Capital. Thank you, and we'll see you again next Wednesday.